Good morning. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm Jane Nakano. I'm senior fellow with CSIS Energy National Security Program. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome back Laszlo Varro. Uh, Mr. Varro is uh, the head of uh, gas, coal, and electricity markets division at the IEA, International Energy Agency, based in Paris. And he served in this uh, capacity since March 2011. The um, IEA uh, does uh, issue um, several uh, midterm market reports, and GAS uh, is one of their key publications. And it looks at, uh, gives a detailed anal analysis, analysis of, and five year projections of uh, natural gas demand supply and trade developments. And uh, in light of the, uh, the oil uh, price uh, decline since last summer, I think there's so much that uh, has perhaps changed uh, since the last report, I would imagine, but there has also been a series of geopolitical developments that have impacted uh, some of the supply pictures, and uh, it's, it's quite timely to have uh, Laszlo back, um, as it's been more or less, uh, you know, it's been a year since the, the oil prices uh, began uh, its decline, and, um, and since you have his bio, uh, before you, I, I don't want to take up too much time, and, and I believe there'll be a lot of questions and answers. Uh, I think historically, whenever we have lots of, we get a lot of great questions and a lot of sort of discussions with the audience. So without further ado, uh, Laszlo, please. Uh, thank you. Gentlemen, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the prospects for natural gas uh, until the end of the decade, but I will take the advantage of being the head of gas, coal, and power uh, at the IE because gas uh, has a very interesting interaction with the rest of the energy system, with coal, with renewables, uh, through the electricity uh, generation sector. Uh, the bottom line conclusion is that gas is slowing down. So despite the significant decline in prices, we revised our headline gas demand projection down uh, globally of, for an average 2.3% growth rate to a 2% growth rate. Now, this 0.3% uh, uh, negative reduction does not seem much, but during the five-year time horizon, this multiplies up to a negative revision of around 140 billion cubic meters uh, this was the, uh, the size of the negative revision of global gas demand for the year 2020. So with a bit of a simplification, the equivalent of Qatar disappeared uh, from uh, the global gas production. And this is, this is despite uh, the declining prices uh, in many important regions. So, so what has happened? Well, first of all, um, in some important regions of the world economy, uh, it was macroeconomic developments uh, which uh, caused the, the reconsideration of the energy projections. The two easy ones, I mean, the, not from a policy point of view, but from an analytical point of view, are the Middle East and Latin America, because the, the declining oil price in general is a good news for the global economy. But for export-dependent, uh, commodity-driven economies, uh, which is the case in the Middle East and also in uh, most countries in Latin America, it is a bad news at a regional level. So there is a significantly lower GDP growth and a significantly lower investment activity in the Middle East, and the Middle East is a very big gas user. And Latin America, speci speci specifically, Brazil is in a recession, Venezuela uh, is facing a difficult situation, so several important countries in Latin America, uh, the outlook is also less bright. Uh, the China is a special case because in China there is an interaction of microeconomic policies and macroeconomic developments. At the microeconomic level, the news for gas are quite good because uh, uh, environmental uh, policy in China is intensifying and there is an increasing political priority in tackling air pollution. And that, of course, benefits clean energy sources such as natural gas. So natural gas is, is rapidly increasing its share in the Chinese energy pie, especially in, especially in uh, residential and commercial applications. So as we speak, on average, 20,000 residential homes are connected into gas heating in China every day. So the northern China has around 100 million buildings which require winter heating. That's a distinguishing factor of China compared to India, Brazil, or Indonesia, where you don't need winter heating. In China, you do need winter heating. And uh, uh, gas is rapidly rolled out to eliminate the correlated consumption in building heating and small-scale boilers. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that parallel to that development, 
the total pie in China, the total energy use, is almost stagnating. There's a, the Chinese economy is not simply slowing down. Okay? If, the, if the only thing that happened in China was that GDP growth goes from 10% to 7%, uh, then the impact on the energy system would not be very large. Uh, but this GDP slowdown is accompanied with a remarkable structural change in the Chinese economy and the rebalancing from the heavy construction activities. Last year, if you, if you had together the, the energy consumption of the cement, steel, aluminum, glass, and plastics industries in China, o over 4% of the total global energy consumption was built into Chinese buildings uh, in the form of cement, steel, glass, and plastics. So as the construction, as the real estate sector slows down in China, as GDP rebalances from uh, the heavy investment and construction-driven economic model, the the impact on energy use is very, very large. Chinese energy consumption growth is much lower than it was before, and that overcompensates the effect of a stronger environmental policy. So we ended up revising Chinese gas demand projections down because no matter how fast gas increases its share in the pie, if the pie is not growing as it used to be, that is a powerful impact. Now, in the OECD countries, the most important reason for the slowdown in gas and the most important reason why we had uh, revisions is that the, the, we revised our electricity demand models and uh, we revised electricity demand uh, growth big time for both Europe, the United States, and also Japan. In fact, in the past three years, electricity consumption has been stagnating both in Europe and also the United States, and it's even declined in Japan, the, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Up until very recently, actually up until the financial crisis, the, uh, there was a very strong relationship between GDP and electricity consumption, even in the most advanced market, market economies. So if you take, let's say, the United States, which had the internet bubble recession in 2000 and the financial crisis in 2008, between these two shocks, the income elasticity of electricity consumption in the US economy was 0.65, so a percentage point of GDP growth was associated with a 0.65% uh, electricity growth uh, in the US economy. In Germany, if you take the structural breaks of the German reunification uh, and the financial crisis, the income elasticity parameter was 0.85, so there was an almost one-to-one -one relationship between electricity and GDP. Whereas in Japan, during the financial crisis, the lost decade of the 1990s, electricity intensity actually increased in the Japanese economy because the export-oriented heavy industries in Japan continue to do well. So the stagnation of electricity consumption is a, is a new phenomenon and a potentially important game changer because in such a huge system as the US or the European electricity system, even a half percent uh, growth uh, matters uh, on a longer term time horizon. Of course, in Europe, the most popular explanation for that uh, is that electricity in Europe is so terribly expensive that all the industry is uh, leaving Europe. Now, if that was the explanation, then the question is that why electricity consumption is not growing here in the United States where electricity is dirt cheap. So the, if I compare Germany, which has very expensive electricity, and the United States, which has dirt cheap electricity, there is no meaningful difference between the recovery from the financial crisis, and there is no meaningful difference between the electricity demand patterns. So this is, this is more than the financial crisis, because under the old structural relationships, the recovery of the financial crisis should have triggered a much stronger electricity consumption growth. And this is not simply about electricity prices, because we don't see meaningful difference between cheap and expensive electricity regions. I think the, the explanation is uh, partly due to the accelerating impact of energy efficiency policies. Uh, the, now in the US, 37 states have state, state level electricity efficiency policies. In Europe, there is a big political drive for energy efficiency, so is in Japan. Uh, so you can see at the micro level that refrigerators, washing machines, uh, uh, freezers, all sorts of household appliances are continuously getting more energy efficient, and that overcompensates the impact of the UIT applications. Okay. The, uh, so, and the other is uh, the structural change in the economy, the increasing share of the service sector. So, and the, the slowdown and stagnation of electricity consumption has a disproportionate imp impact on gas, because in most electricity systems, gas is the highest marginal cost uh, marginal generator. So when you have an unexpectedly low electricity consumption, nuclear plants will continue to run flat out, 
wind and solar will continue to run wherever the weather is favorable, but uh, the higher marginal cost gas plants will be squeezed. Now, within this uh, stagnating and slowly growing electricity system, gas is facing formidable competition from coal. Now, of course, here in the United States, coal is in a bit of a trouble, but the United States is actually an, almost an outlier globally, because if you take the how gas competes with coal, what you find is that the, there are only three important countries, the United States, Australia, and Russia, which have a meaningful coal industry and also large domestic gas resources. So in these three countries, coal competes with domestic gas. But 75% of the global coal use, including China, India, Japan, Korea, Europe, uh, is countries where, uh, uh, where coal competes with imported gas and prices set by LNG, liquefied natural gas. Now that creates two big challenges for gas. One is that the structural changes in the Chinese economy that I described to you had brutal impact on coal markets because, of course, China is heavily coal dependent. So coal prices are falling like a brick, uh, and there's a massive excess supply of dirt cheap coal available out there uh, in international markets. Uh, so which means that the, the recent gas price declines to a very significant degree were simply an attempt to run faster and faster just to stand still. Okay, with the current European gas prices, a year ago, we would have had a gas renaissance in Europe, but that was a year ago, and coal prices have declined by another 25% since then. Uh, so the, the coal is likely to remain very, very cheap because you know, Chinese coal consumption definitely stopped growing fast. Quite possibly it actually peaked. That's, that's a serious possibility. Certainly it's not going to go, uh, grow anywhere near the previous growth rates. And that caught the coal markets completely by surprise. So they, there's an unexpected uh, surplus which will stand on the market for a long, long time. The other major challenge in this context uh, is that uh, liquefied natural gas is the only technological option to transport gas from one continent to another continent. And as the name suggests, you have to liquefy the gas. You have to cool it down to minus 170 degrees uh, in order to put it to a special ship. And the laws of physics tells you that this is never going to be a cheap and easy process. So you pay the liquefaction cost, you pay the shipping cost, by the time you get to Asia, by the time to get to, to Europe, you will be hard pressed to compete. Okay, here in the United States, the coal industry is dreaming about the day when gas prices will go up above $5 per MBTU. The liquefaction and the shipping cost from the United States to Japan is more than $5 per MBTU. So even if gas was for free in the United States, by the time you get to Japan, it will be more expensive. Um, and that meant that the, the the coal plants, which are already built, will happily operate. Okay. And again, it's not difficult to find a green NGO who believes that coal is now over. It's history. It's finished. Uh, nobody, told, nobody told that to the coal industry. Okay. So in the past four years, uh, in just four years, 350 gigawatts of new coal-fired power generation capacity was built in Asia. Uh, that's more than the current U.S. coal fleet. So that was built in four years. Uh, the, uh, and even countries which are abundant in natural gas, such as Malaysia, decided to invest in coal because the economics was just so much more attractive. Now, if you take a cutting edge, high efficiency, ultra supercritical plant, like the new Chinese plants, the Japanese, the Korean plants, or, or, or this Malaysian example, and you run a high efficiency facility on a dirt cheap primary fuel, your marginal cost will be unbeatable. So if you want to constrain the operation of such a plant with gas-fired power generation, you would need either a $4 per MBTU LNG with the current Asian coal prices, good luck for that, or you would need an $8 per MBTU LNG plus a $50 per ton carbon price, which is of course a much higher carbon price than the democratic political process was able to create either in the United States or in Europe. So why do we expect that Vietnam will have it? Uh, of course they will not. So, the, the, so those coal plants that were built uh, they, they will operate base load flat out uh, and generate electricity. Now, China is cleaning up the air. That's a very, very high political priority for them. 
but it's cleaning up the air in a characteristically Chinese fashion. They are not copy-pasting the US and uh, the European example. You know, the US and the European example was that cleaning up the air was primarily done by converting things to natural gas, and so natural gas reached a 20, 25% of total energy consumption. I don't think natural gas will reach the 25% of the Chinese energy consumption probably ever in history. Uh, if you take a look at the investments that are taking place currently in the Chinese energy sector motivated by Chinese environmental policy, the biggest by far is the least known outside China, is the, the investment wave to equip the Chinese coal-fired power plants with modern environmental control technologies, most importantly electrostatic filters which deal with particulate smog uh, and flue gas desulfurization which deals with acid rain uh, related emissions. So we believe that by the end of the decade, that will enable China, uh, that, that will enable China to transfer over a thousand terawatt hours of coal-fired power generation, which is more than the entire electricity production of Japan, uh, from dirty coal plants to clean coal plants equipped with modern environmental controls. That's the, that's the biggest single thing by far. So even though coal in China stopped growing rapidly, it will remain the largest single energy source in the Chinese economy, hands down, for a long, long time. Now, the second largest thing that is happening in China is a genuinely gigantic investment wave into low carbon energy sources, uh, nuclear, hydropower, wind, and solar. China is the largest investor in the world economy in all four of these sources. If you combine these four, it is significantly more than what the United States and, the Euro and Europe is doing combined. Okay, so so you, anybody who criticizes the the climate agreement uh, that was signed between the United States and China on the grounds that China is not doing anything is not familiar with the real life data uh, of the Chinese energy system. It's a very, very strong investment effort which is ongoing in China for low carbon energy sources. Natural gas is actually a distant third uh, in the rank of the solutions. It does play a role, but it's not going to be a natural gas based uh, energy system. Now, another even probably more serious challenge that whereas if you are relaxed about climate change, you just stick to coal. But if you do care about climate change, you increasingly switch to wind and solar. Okay. So the, the numbers that I show to you are not done by, a, by an analysis or an economic model or an assessment and so on. These are real life contracts signed by real investors who are putting real money into projects. Uh, and each and every one of these uh, project contracts, wind power in the Atlantic coast of Brazil, solar power in Gujarat, wind, wind power and solar power in South Africa, solar power in Dubai, wind power in northern China, each and every one of them are cheaper without a single cent of subsidy than burning imported LNG in a gas fired power plant in that country. Okay. So the, interestingly, the, the interesting question for LNG is no longer whether is it competitive with Russian gas. The interesting question is whether is it competitive with solar power in India? And the answer is increasingly no. Uh, the, uh, that, uh, that means that for, in some countries, the investments into domestic renewables constrain uh, the, uh, the import dependency on gas. In other countries like South Africa, which is an extremely coal dependent country, I don't think South Africa should bother starting to import LNG. They should continue their exit. They could sh should continue the wind and solar program that they launched, uh, and they can diversify away from coal in a much, much more cost-efficient fashion. Now, of course, you, the wind does not blow always, and the sun does not shine always. You do need flexibility into a power system which has large uh, wind and solar capacities. And that is very often mentioned as the critical contribution of gas, but this role puts gas into competition with Google. Yeah, the, the systematic application of modern IT technology on electricity system operation uh, delivers very, very interesting results which have major impact on how much gas uh, flexibility you need in the power system. Wind and solar cannot be predicted, well, the future cannot be predicted in general, but it turns out that if you build a big data uh, system for wind and solar data uh, and have the proper algorithms, that it is actually much more predictable than we previously thought. The average prediction error of future wind speeds in Spain, which is the most advanced system in this respect, was, declined, uh, was cut by half. Wind is much more predictable than what we previously thought. Uh, close to real-time operation uh, uh, makes this predictability even better. Then, the, in Germany, in the past five years, 
the reserve requirements of the German system were revised down. <laughs> because parallelly to the deployment of wind and solar power, there was also a major effort to improve the coordination and IT communication between the German system operators and the synergies from better communication and better IT control overcompensated the volatility coming from wind and solar. So if you ask the question how much backup capacity Germany needs for these new wind and solar capacities, the answer is zero. Zero. Nothing at all. Uh, and last but not least, there is a very important innovation in the renewable industry itself to make the renewable production smoother. We are talking about wind turbines which are specifically designed to generate less electricity in strong winds but generate more electricity in weak winds uh, and have smoother operations. So the, so the old stereotype that you need a gas turbine backing up every windmill is absolutely not true. This is the, 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 the flexibility of the power system is provided by a portfolio of sources of which gas is one but not necessarily the cheapest option. Here in the United States, for example, decentralized internet-based demand-side response aggregators regularly beat gas-fired power plants in uh, capacity auctions for, for, uh, uh, for the capacity mechanisms. The, however, there is one very good news for gas, and that's the way God created the solar system. Because currently, the most promising and most rapidly growing renewable source is solar PV. Uh, now, for solar PV, it faces two challenges. One, that the Earth is spinning, so we have a night. Uh, that problem, I believe, will increasingly be solved by batteries. I'm very excited about the Tesla battery product. Uh, the, I think that's going to be a very successful product and will play a significant role in taking the solar production at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and using it at 10 o'clock in the evening. That batteries can do. But there's another challenge for solar PV, and there's the declination of the Earth, which is the reason why we have winter. Now, if you are, a, a, if you are in the middle latitudes, uh, like New York, like uh, Europe, like Japan, or, or, or most of China, then around 85% of your annual solar PV production will be between the middle of March and the middle of October. And if you are an average middle class citizen, and you want to rely only on your solar panel and your batteries, uh, the, no, I, we don't want any centralized energy system, then you run the numbers, it turns out that on average, you will need a 1,700 kilowatt hours winter stockpile accumulated by the middle of October, because this is the mismatch between your average winter solar production and winter consumption. Now, this is 250 Tesla batteries. Okay, so make sure that you have a pretty big garage uh, to, to, to have all those batteries fit. Uh, the, uh, so unless there is a genuinely revolutionary technological breakthrough, you will need dispatchable power generation to get through the seasonal fluctuations. In Europe, for example, half of the gas-fired power generation is cogeneration, which is running only in the winter when there is not much sun sunshine. That is not going to change with the current level of technology. Now, another interesting application where declining oil prices had an impact is natural gas in the transportation sector. Uh, the, there, there are diverging fortunes uh, in different transportation segments. I believe that for personal vehicles, for cars, gas missed the boat, uh, and electric cars will leapfrog. Okay. The, the market for CNG cars completely collapsed with the oil prices. The market for electric cars actually continued to grow, grow, continues to grow very nicely. People who buy electric cars, they buy them because this is the right thing to do. They don't really care about declining gasoline prices. Uh, the, uh, and also electric cars have been very successful of capturing the uh, consumer's imagination. But there is more to the transportation system than Tesla cars. Uh, Tesla is yet to offer an electric cement truck uh, the, uh, or an electric uh, garbage truck uh, or a delivery van. These things are not as fashionable, but they consume very large amounts of energy. And interesting enough, this segment also continues to grow because in this segment, what really matters is whether you already rolled out the infrastructure. And if the infrastructure is rolled out, then gas is robustly competitive even with the current oil prices. So this is the, the US vehicle market uh, last year. This narrow little black thing is CNG cars, completely negligible compared to the nicely growing electric car segment. But the overall impact of natural gas vehicles is four times bigger than electric cars. But that's four times bigger impact is in school buses, uh, municipal vehicles, uh, garbage trucks, uh, delivery vans, uh, and so on. Uh, where 
uh, natural gas is, is emerging as a quite significant alternative to, to diesel fuel. Another interesting transportation application is LNG as a bunker fuel. For 100 years, the refining industry was working from the assumption that any dirty junk which is left at the bottom of the barrel can be get rid of by burning in ships. Now, so once you introduce environmental regulations on ships, uh, the game changes. Now, if you ask a chemical engineer whether is it possible to produce sulfur free bunker fuel, the answer is yes, it does not follow the laws of chemistry, it can be done. But the amount of investment that you need in a refinery to do so is not trivial. So, so LNG is very much emerging as a potentially competitive bunker, uh, clean bunker fuel. And it also benefits from the fact that global shipping heavily concentrates on maybe a dozen megaports like Singapore, Yokohama, Dubai, Rotterdam, which almost all of them already has, have an LNG terminal. Uh, so LNG is regularly arriving into Yokohama or Singapore or Rotterdam. You have to sort out the local bunkering infrastructure, but that, that can be done. So that, I believe, is, is, and that segment also very nicely survived uh, the declining oil prices. Now, on the supply side, the as demand is slowing down, of course, uh, of course, supply is slowing down as well. The major negative revisions uh, compared to last year's projection were, first of, all, so first of all, the Middle East, where in the Middle East we see bad upstream regulation, inadequate uh, upstream investment, and also uh, prevalent security problems in a number of countries. Libyan gas production never recovered from the civil war. Yemen uh, uh, LNG was lost uh, to the conflict, uh, and frankly, it's, it, it's difficult to be very optimistic on the short term uh, about the, the, the improvements on these things. We also had a, a significant negative revision on Africa uh, for pretty much the same reasons. Uh, the bad investment environment, inadequate upstream investment, and hardcore security problems uh, in some parts of Africa. And the third uh, significant negative revision, around the 40 billion cubic meters were cut from our Chinese uh, domestic gas production projections. China is apparently facing quite uh, significant challenges in uh, developing shale gas, uh, shale gas uh, in China. Now, we do believe that those challenges will, will eventually be tackled. So we have, we, we have a, a, growing domestic demand pro a growing domestic production projection for China. Uh, and, sh and shale gas will eventually emerge in China, but it's not going to be a copy-paste of the North American experiment. It's, it's much more difficult, and it's going to be a much slower, uh, much slower process. The, in North America specifically, when, when we started crunching the numbers, the first thing I asked from my team is that if lower oil prices kick the U.S. light title industry hard, how much we have to revise gas production numbers down, because in the past couple of years, U.S. gas production growth very strongly benefited from the expanding light title industry and the associated gas production uh, in uh, uh, the Permian uh, and Eagle Ford. Now, we actually ended up revising North American gas production up because it is not only the declining oil price which happens in North America. The declining oil price triggered a brutal wave of cost cutting uh, in the oil field service industries. And there is a continuous learning by doing and a continuous technological development uh, in the industry. And we came to the conclusion that the better technology and, and uh, more stringent cost management overcompensates the impact uh, of the loss of revenues from uh, associated liquids. Uh, so we had a significant positive revision for uh, North America. And I should, I should mention as well that the, despite uh, uh, despite we, us being pessimistic about the prospects of the LNG projects in Western Canada, we actually project increasing gas production in Canada because by the end of the decade, very large volume of gas will leave North America from the southern United States, the LNG exports from the Gulf Coast and the pipeline exports to Mexico, which will trigger a north-south gas flow across the North American gas system and suck in production increase also from Canada. So Canadian gas production starts to recover even before any of the Canadian LNG export projects being built. The, whereas about Canada, we are pessimistic, but we do foresee a very large wave of LNG hitting the waters. The first wave is the Australian projects, which, are, which had a difficult adventure, but now the, 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 that adventure is, is now largely over, and the projects are coming online one by one. 
And the second wave is uh, in the, in the, uh, close to the end of the decade, the US LNG projects. So far, the US LNG projects have succeeded in avoiding the, the project management adventures uh, of Australia, and hopefully that will, will remain that way. Uh, outside Australia and, uh, uh, and North America, the only major LNG project which has uh, some chance, uh, some possibility of coming online this decade, it is not in our baseline projection, but it is, there is a possibility that they could uh, make it happen, is, is Yabal LNG. Mm -hmm. Without the sanctions of Russia, it would very firmly be in our baseline. But of course, with sanctions of Russia, uh, they face extremely diffi serious difficulties uh, securing project financing for Yamal LNG. Uh, it remains to be seen uh, whether, they can, uh, whether they can finance uh, that project under the current political environment. However, even though the, the US projects progress well from a project management point of view, there we also see an impact uh, of oil prices. Now, in 2013, first half of 2014, oil prices were not simply high, but also high and stable. So $100, $110 per barrel. And that created the illusion of predictability. Now, if you start from the assumption that you can buy at Harry Hub, you liquefy it, you ship it to Asia, and then you sell it in Japan and Korea at oil indexed Asian prices, then, I mean, this is a license to print money. Uh, so during that period, look at the green dots, 2013, first half of 2014, a multi-billion dollar contract was signed for US LNG literally every week, uh, and the buyers are the who is who of the Asian and the European energy establishment. The large major contracts were signed in August uh, 2014, just a week before oil prices started to collapse. Uh, ever since oil prices started to decline, we see a very different attitude from the, uh, from the potential buyers. Uh, since last August, there was only one contract signed for US LNG, and that was less than a million tons, uh, so it's a really small quantity. Very visibly, the potential buyers are asking themselves the question that, you know, hold on, let's slow down a bit, hold on for a second, does it, make still, does it still make sense? Is it still competitive? Now, we, we, we believe that it is still competitive, but it is no longer a money machine. It is something which is competitive, but you have to be careful about your project management, you have to be careful about your portfolio, you do take risks. Now, of course, the green dots, the projects that signed off the contracts, have absolutely no difficulty uh, using those contracts to mobilize investment capital. Consequently, even in the period of declining oil prices, several large US projects started construction, and we have no doubt that those projects will go ahead, but we believe that there will be a measurable slowdown uh, in the further developments. Uh, the, we, look, we took a look at how the market is absorbing this big change in the net trade positions. The, in the case of Australia, the change in the net position is that they export much more. In the case of North America, North America is changing from a small importer to a large exporter. So that's also a very large change in the net trade position. Plus, you can add Japan and Korea, which will import more because of the recovery of nuclear power in Japan. Uh, coal is doing very well in both Japan and Korea. Solar power is doing well in Japan. So there are a long list of reasons why LNG imports will decline in industrialized Asia. Interestingly, the, the biggest component of how the market absorbed that, that LNG is the region which we don't really talk about very often, the Asia outside Japan and China. Okay, there's more to Asia than Japan and China. Uh, traditionally, the gas industry looked at that part of the world as a large net exporter with Indonesia and Malaysia. But what we see is that in, in Indonesia and Malaysia, they continue to export, but increasing quantities of gas are absorbed by domestic demand, so their exports decline. India currently has an underutilized gas infrastructure and underutilized gas fired power generation capacity. Okay, a $15 per MBTU LNG price is simply not economically viable for India. It's, not, it's just not affordable. So at, at the uh, the skyrocketing high gas prices, they just refuse to buy and, uh, and they, they underutilize their infrastructure capacities. But India has a serious energy shortage. So India is one of the countries which will take advantage of the better availability of LNG, uh, import more, and electrify the country more rapidly. Uh, and last but not least, uh, in all around in the rest of Asia, you have a new LNG import project coming in the Philippines, two in Vietnam, yet another one in Thailand, yet another one in Pakistan, a million tons here, a million tons there, and the numbers add up pretty quickly. So, so non OECD Asia is the biggest uh, single sink for the new LNG. China will import more LNG, but in China, LNG will have to compete. China has other options. 
Uh, but un realistically, Asia will not absorb this big wave of LNG. Uh, so there will be additional LNG cargoes looking for a place. Now, if we are talking about small quantities, you can sell a cargo or two in the Middle East or in Latin, Latin America. But in really large quantities, if you have to go to somewhere, that somewhere is Europe. Uh, so LNG will have to come back to Europe. And the big question is, what will be Gazprom's strategic response where the American invasion begins? Uh, the, because Gazprom can decide to go to a price war. And given that they have a very low marginal cost production and no already sunk cost infrastructure, if they decide to go to a price war, they can fight really hard. Uh, if they decide to do that, then the Russians and the Americans will beat down the price of gas in Europe to the level when it finally starts to be competitive with coal. And in that case, American gas will replace coal in the European uh, energy system. Or Gazprom can decide just to tough it out uh, and protect its contract portfolio and let the Americans come in. Uh, now, I don't claim to have any insider information of what Gazprom's strategic thinking uh, on this question. Our modeling was based on the observation that in the past five years, Gazprom very consistently had the strategy of protecting its contract portfolio. That has been their strategy. And we based our modeling on this assumption that basically Gazprom will focus on protecting its contract portfolio and will let uh, American LNG entering uh, the European markets. Uh, China specifically has a, an almost, uh, uh, 200, almost 150 billion cubic meters demand increase where the, the demand increase will be supplied by a nearly perfect diversification. Uh, the biggest source, uh, the biggest increasing source to China is the pipeline imports, both from Turkmenistan and also by the end of the decade also to, uh, from Russia. The second biggest source is the increasing domestic production. Even with the difficulties of, uh, of shale gas that they face, they do have a meaningful increase in domestic production. And LNG is only the third source. So it's, it's, a very co it's going to be a very competitive uh, gas market. Specifically on the Russia-China pipeline, uh, so we believe that this is a project which Russia can do even under sanctions from the West. Uh, developing the Boven and Kov uh, sorry, developing the Kovitskaya and the Chayandinskoya fields uh, and building the new pipeline across uh, East Siberia is difficult, but it is a type of difficulty that the Russians have done before. So Gazprom has the technological capability to do that, and most of the costs are in rubles because they can re rely on uh, the domestic industry, and Russia is not running out of rubles. Okay? They, they, they can print uh, as much as they want. Uh, so so we, we do believe that this project has a, has, has a very strong strategic priority from the Russian side, and we also believe that they have the capability to do that even in the current uh, geopolitical environment. However, there is a period, an age of capital discipline coming. Uh, we also, our impression is that currently Gazprom has the capital strengths to do one big thing. And we also based our, based our modeling on the assumption that that one big thing will be the Siberia China. All the rest is public relations. Okay. So South Stream was canceled last year because of various, officially it was canceled because of various legal difficulties. It is possible to, to structure a major pipeline project so that it complies with European law. It can be done. Gazprom could have done it. Uh, I, I believe that they were simply running out of money. Uh, same, same story about Turkey Stream. Given that Gazprom already contracted for steel pipes uh, and, uh, and engineering services for Turkey Stream, uh, they can build maybe one stream for the Turkish stream, but they, not, they, not ha they, they don't have the capital strengths uh, on, uh, for uh, redirecting all the gas flows. Same applies for the North Stream, uh, North stream uh, expansion as well. I wouldn't bet on any of these projects at a bookmaker. Uh, the, uh, which also means that the current transit contract between Russia and Ukraine is expiring in 2019. Gazprom is on the record stating that after the expiry of this contract, they want to eliminate transit through Ukraine. We don't believe this to be credible. We, we, we believe that Ukraine will remain an important transit country. And I should also emphasize that in the past year, Ukraine proved to be a very reliable transit country. Uh, they faced a military conflict and a serious macroeconomic crisis. 
but all the transit obligations were fulfilled by the latter. So that, that is something to be, to be recognized. Uh, in Europe, we do foresee an increase of gas demand. Uh, I'm cheating a bit because 2014, the baseline year, was an abnormally warm year. So more than half of the demand increase that we project is actually the normalization of the winter temperature. Specifically, adjusted by temperature, uh, residential gas consumption in Europe is now has a structural decline because the slow but steady improvements in energy efficiency now overcompensate everything else. So you can have a, you can have a, a cold winter, in which case heating energy demand goes up, but adjusted by temperature, it is now structural decline for building heating. And in the power generation sector, uh, to the extent Europe ever had a core renaissance, that is now over, with the large compression plan directive kicking in, uh, coal plants are being decommissioned, uh, and uh, uh, that enables some recovery of gas consumption. We already see that happening in the United Kingdom. And last but not least, Europe will continue to lose nuclear capacity. Uh, so, um, so gas is recovering primarily in the power generation sector. It's very important that we became very pessimistic about European production. I mean, if you combine what the low oil prices do to the investment in the North Sea, plus the decisions of the Dutch government to constrain production in Groningen because of the earthquake risk, plus the almost comprehensive failure of shale gas all around the European continent, uh, the outlook is really bleak. So our numbers suggest that under normal market conditions, the amount of US LNG coming to Europe will roughly be sufficient to compensate for the decline of domestic production, but it will not really eat into the European purchases of Russian gas. So the European imports uh, of Russian gas will, change, will, will remain roughly at the current level, but they not increase further. And that is true beyond 2020 as well. Europe is facing a simultaneous decline of three very important domestic energy sources. Coal is facing a crunch time because of European climate policy. If you wanted to, rep if you wanted to compensate the decline of coal with domestic renewables in Europe, you would need 120,000 windmills uh, in the next uh, 20 years. Germany currently has 22,000. So 120,000 is quite a lot. Nuclear is also facing a crunch time. There, is a, there, there are a couple of nuclear plants here and there under construction in Europe, United Kingdom, one in France, one in Finland, uh, but they will not be able to compensate for all the nuclear phase-out policies. If you take the nuclear reactors, which are currently scheduled to close down in the next 20 years, their production could be compensated by solar panels of 52 million uh, uh, homes, and uh, you add the depletion of the North Sea. So wind and solar is growing in Europe, but there's no chance in hell uh, that they can compensate for the simultaneous decline of these three important domestic resources. That's, uh, and that meant that the Ukraine conflict uh, created very pessimistic expectations uh, about gas in Europe. Uh, the interesting, there's an interesting disconnection that the, the Ukraine conflict did not lead to a physical disruption of gas supplies into Europe. In fact, the, in the European gas industry, the opinions are very firmly in the comfort zone. So the, the European gas industry does not really believe that we, we have an, a significant energy security problem. But at the same time, at the foreign policy level, the trust in Russia is worse than in any time since the Cold War. And that's, this, is an, this is a dangerous imbalance because Europe currently does not have the ability to keep the lights on without Russian gas. Such a relationship has to be built on the foundation of trust. Now, whether this trust can be rebuilt or not, I mean, that's a foreign policy question and I cannot, I, I cannot comment on it. But what is certainly a okay case that, the, that, uh, that unless, the, unless this trust is being rebuilt, there will have to be consequences for energy policy and energy security measures uh, as well. You, you cannot have a disconnection between the foreign policy and the energy uh, industry uh, mindset. Uh, and of course, the second biggest import source to Europe is North Africa. Uh, the, now North Africa, for reasons unrelated to the Russian conflict, is also a quite difficult area. In fact, the largest geopolitically related gas supply disruption in European history was the disruption of Libyan gas supplies uh, to Europe, uh, which never recovered from the civil war, and that was replaced by, guess what, Russian gas. Uh, so, the, the, so without the emergence of large new LNG sources, uh, 
uh, the outlook would be very, very pessimistic. However, with the emergence of new LNG sources, we have a chance to transform this perception uh, into something like this and, and restore the trust in gas. And on that optimistic note, I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Ah, I must stay here. Sure, this is yours. Thanks so much. A uh, lot of information uh, uh, um, and a lot of uh, thought-provoking points. And I suppose this Captain America poster coming soon probably says to your nearest you know, LNG importing facilities. Uh, pretty exciting. Um, I do have a lot of questions. I wanted to open up with a couple of questions, uh, but then invite the audience to ask them questions. The ground rules would be to please uh, identify yourself, uh, who you're with, and then also wait for the microphone. Uh, to start with, uh, I do have a lot of questions that I can ask, but uh, on the supply side, though, uh, you, you did mention North Africa and also earlier on for the supply picture. Um, the uh, Africa, for now, is, you know, I think, um, you know, there's still net importing region for the next five years. Of course, you know, East Africa has a great potential. Where would you put it um, for which one of this, the future uh, you know, uh, the midterm market, uh, gas market uh, reports, do you see the East Africa portion starting to show? Um. Okay, uh, I mean, East Africa is facing a challenge which is shared by Australia, Canada, many other regions, is that the, the I mean, there, there is no LNG industry, okay? There is only an oil and gas industry. And that oil and gas industry, you know, companies like ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, they, we call them oil companies, but they are increasing the, in fact, gas companies. I mean, Shell is already a gas company in terms of their, their, their production structure. So they play a critically important role in developing new gas projects. For in East Africa, if and when the development will happen, there is no doubt that the super majors will play a, a major uh, role in that. Now, for practically all of the super majors, their strategic response to the declining oil price was to cut capital spending quite significantly while maintaining the dividend uh, payouts uh, for the shareholders. Uh, and I have to say that, uh, that from the point of view of a capital allocation of an oil and gas company, a long lead time, capital intensive LNG project uh, in a potentially politically risky location, I mean, that's a very attractive target uh, to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to be cut if you have to cut capital spending. Uh, so, so a very significant proportion of these projects maybe not cancelled and maybe not killed for good, but at least delayed uh, for several years. So, uh, and, and given, even if it started today, it would take at least five to seven years to have a full development in East Africa. So, so I think for, for East Africa now got into the question of, or let's say, what is the next big thing around 2025? And, and if, you, if you ask that question, then yes, East Africa is a very credible candidate for being the next big sink. But, uh, but uh, before that, I think they will face delays. Uh, so, questions from the audience? Yes, hi, Rich. Uh, staying on, Rich Koslerich from George Mason University. Uh, staying on the uh, gas supply question for Europe. You didn't mention the Southern Gas Corridor from, from Azerbaijan. Um, there, there seems to be a fixation in the media that somehow this is going to uh, change the, the energy balance in Europe, but uh, getting much beyond 10 BCM in a reasonable time frame doesn't seem to be in the cards. Where do you see that fitting into your, your description of the yes. supply situation? Okay. Now, uh Azerbaijan is moving ahead with the Shakhdani's development uh, and the Tanap top pipeline developments, which will deliver uh, precisely, as you mentioned, 10 BCM uh, to southern Italy. This 10 BCM uh, is around 2% of European gas supply. Uh, it, is, it is useful, and it, also, it is also, I would say, this is the first major project which was developed after the European Union third package was implemented. So it's a very important vote of confidence uh, in the new European regulatory environment. So I think it, it is a major success, but in, in volumetric terms, it's not going to be more than, than, than 2% for the first phase. Now, Azerbaijan has more than Shakhdanis. They have the Absheron discovery by Total. They have the deep layers of Azerbaijan and Gunashli. Uh, so uh, 
in the second half of the 2020s, uh, our projections show a higher level of exports uh, from Azerbaijan than, uh, than what Shakhtaris could do alone. Uh, but, uh, but I agree with you that that's, we are talking about the second half of the 2020s. Now, on that time horizon, there are, there are three countries that can potentially be game changers uh, if the politics works out well. Uh, that's uh, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Iraq. Uh, the uh, Turkmenistan uh, is currently very strongly orienting towards China. So uh, the infrastructure system is already being built up. So two pipelines are already operational towards China. One is being completed, the fourth started construction. CMPC is involved in the field development of the Ganeshlik supergiant field. So, so it's, it's hard to see how Europe will come back after the Chinese having such a, uh, such a headwind uh, in the race. Uh, in the case of Iran, you would need a, you would need a, a geopolitical green light uh, plus, you would need the Iranians getting direct together because even if there is a geopolitical green light, the current investment environment in Iran is not, not very attractive. Uh, in the case of Iraq, the Kormor and the Chemchemal giant fields in Iraqi Kurdistan could outcompete Azerbaijan hands down uh, from the point of view of their, their geological attractiveness. Uh, but that, again, would require a series of optimistic assumptions on the political and security situation uh, in the region. Uh, Either of that could happen, but uh, frankly, Europe does not have a very strong ability to influence the developments on the ground uh, for, for any of them. So it's, uh, it's, more like, uh, it's more like we hope that the situation will improve rather than uh, have, we can have a well-designed strategy to improve it. Thank you, Kevin Massey with Statoil. Um, two questions. The first is uh, just a kind of reflection, I guess, on the evolution of thinking in the IEA uh, around gas. Four years ago, we were heralding the golden age of gas. Um, what have been the major kind of changes in, in the picture that have brought us to where we are now? Uh, and second is when you look at the US gas supply situation, um, uh, and, the, and therefore the shale uh, gas production potential and the, and the LNG export potential, do you take account of upstream regulation? Uh, and are there uh, things that uh, could change that would change the, the outlook for US production? Uh, first of all, uh, the, first of all the, the, the golden age of gas, I, I, actually, I actually was expecting this question, so I read that, the, that original report, and I, uh, the, uh, uh, it, the, the picture is mixed. Uh, I mean, here in the United States, uh, uh, our current product pro projection for U.S. gas production for 2020 is higher than what the Golden Age of Gas report four years ago projected for 2030. Okay, so so North American product, North American shale production is running a decade ahead of the Golden Age. It's like a diamond age or a platinum age. It's just <laughs> beyond. Uh, the already already in the Already in the uh, Golden Age of Gas report, we emphasize that conventional, good old-fashioned conventional exploration is not out of fashion. Now, since the publication of that report, the resource base that was discovered in East Africa is equivalent to 85 years' worth of U.S. shale gas production. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that exploration success, again, very much confirmed uh, uh, our, our view on the, on the Golden Age of Gas. Uh, however, uh, we have been disappointed uh, by, um, in the past four years, uh, if there is somebody from ExxonMobil, then congratulations for Papua New Guinea, because ExxonMobil did brought Papua New Guinea uh, LNG online ahead of schedule without the cost overrun. But apart from that, everywhere from Angola to Australia, the project management experience has been extremely, extremely negative. Uh, and, the, and that, uh, and when you have LNG with multi-billion dollar cost overruns, competing with low carbon resources where the technology is improving and the costs are declining. I mean, that's, that's not the way to win. Uh, so the, so it, uh, the LNG industry has to get its act together and has to deliver projects uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a very reliable, uh, reliable fashion. Uh, and I would, should also mention that the most important reason uh, for the negative revisions uh, on gas demand is the revisions of total energy consumption growth in China. 
and the revisions of electricity consumption growth uh, in the advanced industrialized economies. So the, in terms of the share of gas in the total energy system, it is increasing. It is growing more rapidly than total energy use. Uh, and uh, for your other question, uh, we, did, we did run a scenario, not, this, not in this report, but um, two years ago. Uh, we did run a scenario for North America which we titled, What if the tide turns? Uh, which basically assumed that something like the shale gas equivalent of Fukushima happens, uh, and uh, there is a political backlash uh, against hydro fracturing uh, in North America. Now, in that scenario, the United States goes back uh, into a gas, uh, gas importer. Uh, gas prices in the United States uh, roughly double, uh, and uh, coal is happily coming back to a second life. Uh, now, uh, you know, unexpected black strands have happened in history, but currently we, I don't see a very high political risk. Uh, and I don't, see, I don't see many US policymakers who would find this an attractive future. Yes, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Dieters from the Depart US Department of Energy. I wanted to find out if you had factored in the, the European Commission anti-competition case against Gazprom into some of your calculations about uh, Russian natural gas prices to Europe. Uh, there was a presentation about it uh, two or three months ago that said that you know, the results of that uh, investigation or the results of that suit could dramatically decrease prices of Russian gas just because it would make public you know, the past uh, uh, pricing uh, practices. I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts of that, if you, if you felt that there was an impact on prices to Europe or even to chi China or other you know, customers for Russian gas. Uh, I I would not like to comment on this specific prosecution case uh, because that's uh, 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 most of most most details are kept confidentially by by DG competition. Uh, in in general, but in general, the the uh, there is a more stringent enforcement of third party access and competition law in the European gas in, uh, gas system in general. So the 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 competition prosecution against Gazprom is, I would say, a legally a separate case, but at the big picture level, uh, it is one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle uh, is the capacity allocation guidelines developed by ESA, the Agency for the Coordination for Energy Regulation, which will significantly enhance the transparency of capacity allocation, some of the initiatives of the Energy Union, uh, and so on. So altogether, uh, altogether, there is a very significant likelihood uh, that this will lead to a much more interconnected, much more transparent, much more competitive gas market inside Europe. Now, whereas the European Union does not have very strong capabilities to influence the developments in the ground in Turkmenistan, it does have very strong legal tools to influence the developments in the ground in Europe itself, and they are using that. Uh, so, the, so I would say that the Europe is being lucky with North American LNG coming to the market because that creates the fundamental basis of competition. But the regulators and the policymakers and the competition authorities have to do their homework as well. Uh, the, now, whether, you know, whether the specific Gazprom case because uh, will result in a, an out-of-court settlement between the European authorities or Gazprom, or whether it will, settle, it will uh, uh, conclude with a harsh fine and structural remedies, time will tell. Uh, but certainly, the, from the point of view of regulation and, comp uh, and competition policy, the situation is improving in Europe. And I also took a note that, uh, Tom, your, your question also included, you know, what, may they, that what the implication may be for Asia. I think a lot of, you know, major LNG importers in Asia are closely watching, I mean, because that's something that the details also include, you know, the uh, destination, destination clauses and how, now it's not only Russia, but, you know, in my view, you know, then what other major suppliers may have to do, like Qataris, et cetera, and then how that may, uh, may or may not, but you know, uh, the, certainly, yeah, the uh, buyers in other regions also closely watching. So, and yeah, Frank? Thanks. Frank for Astro, CSIS. Laszlo, thank you. It's always content rich, great presentation. Um, I wanna take you beyond your slides, though. So, two things that you alluded to, as, as the gas market changes, especially over the last couple of years, can you talk a little bit about um, evolving financing and what contracts, what changes need to be made on the, on the 
commercial side. And on the geopolitical side, when you look at um, interconnections, specific countries, so like Turkey, for example, right? If you look at Iran, Iraq, uh, Middle Eastern gas moving to Europe, what are national policies and what can they do? If the EU doesn't step up, what are the roles of individual countries when infrastructure gets put in place? Well, on the, uh, on, on the evolving market and, and financing, when, when, the third part get, when a third package was discussed, then there were concerns and there were claims by the gas industry that it will be just impossible to develop new supply projects under such a regulation. Uh, now, there were a couple of success stories that proved them wrong. Uh, one of them, for example, is the South Hook LNG project, which is a Qatari uh, LNG project in the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, typically, typically, Qatar is not an enthusiastic proponent uh, of the idea of liberalized gas markets, uh, but uh, the, uh, so what the Qataris managed to, they did the homework. Uh, they structured their project in a way that even the, the United Kingdom has the most, I would say, the most stringent pro-market uh, regulatory regime uh, in Europe. And the Qataris could structure their project so that, so that it complied uh, with all the UK regulatory environment and, and everybody is happy and the project is, is happily operating. Uh, but that was an LNG project. Uh, that's why I think that the, the, that, uh, that uh, uh, Shagdanese and TOP had, uh, had the impact of breaking the psychological, uh, being a psychological barrier because that was a pipeline project. And of course, with a pipeline project, you don't have uh, uh, you don't have market flexibility. Uh, a pipeline is like a handcuff, that you, you physically handcuff the exporter and the importer together. So that, that requires a very strong uh, uh, stakeholder uh, relationship. And even that was possible to be done uh, in an exemplary fashion. So the, the top pipeline project received uh, an Article 38 exemption uh, from the European Commission. Uh, there are, more, there are more than 10 buyers uh, on the European side, uh, so, it's not, so the project is not reinforcing the dominant position of a conventional monopoly, but creates a competitive structure at the, at the entry point. Uh, of course, uh, th that project very strongly benefited from having uh, Sokar and BP, you know, a powerful and rich national oil company, and a powerful, rich and professional in IOC, having a strong strategic commitment and pushing it, uh, pushing it ahead. That, that is, this is how life is, that, that has to be done. Now, what individual countries can do, I spent, before coming to the IEA, I spent several years from my life working on the Nabucco pipeline project. Uh, so uh, you learn a lot from your failures. So that's, uh, I, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad I did that. Uh, I have to say that medium-sized European countries cannot do all that much. Uh, that's, the, uh, that, that's, the, that's the number one lesson from the failure of the Nabucco uh, uh, pipeline project. And I think for this reason, uh, there will be a stronger strategic emphasis on LNG. Because we have, we have seen in the, case of, in the case of, let's say, Lithuania, that even a small country can do a lot on LNG. Uh, so, and can, you can have a, a, you can lease a floating LNG terminal, you can have it delivered uh, on the coast, you link it to your pipeline system and so on. Uh, your capabilities are, are, are much stronger uh, in, in that level. So the, um, I think the, the, only, you know, the only way I can conceive a, a large degree of flow from the Middle East to, uh, the, uh, to Europe is if the political situation either in Iran or in Iraq or in both improves to the level that eventually you have players like Sokar emerging, you know, who, who have the upstream resources and they want to push them to the end uh, user market and make it happen. I think without that, uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think you can do much from, from a medium-sized European country. Andrew? Sure. Uh, Andrew Dowdy, consultant. Uh, Laszlo really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, a couple of I'd appreciate if you could give it a little bit of thought or give us some of your insights on the cost structure, the future cost structure of LNG. If you go back to the 1990s, which I realized was a long time ago, but uh, people were marketing LNG for probably less than $3 a million BTUs delivered. I talked to somebody once who said they'd shipped uh, LNG from Trinidad and Tobago to Boston for less than two. And 
obviously there's inflation, but I think in real terms, the cost of liquefying and shipping LNG has gone up phenomenally in real terms, in part because of the shortage of, of construction construction companies that are qualified to build. As we saw in Australia, the cost per ton of liquefaction just shot up. So longer term, if you see that trend softening, will we see something almost like the drilling industry? So you, you might see cost, capital costs start to come back down. And that's, that's the first part of the question. The second part would be, for all intents and purposes, the LNG facilities in the United States, uh, the, the capital cost is sunk. And so the marginal cost of, say, shipping LNG into Europe, if you're a merchant broker, would simply be the cost of buying, buying at Henry Hub and shipping it across the pond, uh, which could very well fall, you know, well below $5 a million BTUs. Anyway, I just appreciate your thoughts on, on how that future cost structure might play out. Yes, well, uh, I, mean, I, think, I think in general, probably in the past decade, the increasing complexity uh, of upstream projects uh, a bit outrun the ability of the oil and gas industry to manage that complexity. So the, this, this difficult project management and cost management experience, this is not unique to LNG. Uh, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the more difficult oil projects had the same unfortunate experience. Uh, the, uh, specifically, uh, specifically in LNG, I mean, I mean, Australia had a, a very unfortunate combination of remote locations, uh, labor scarcity, very tight environmental regulations, and competition with the mining sector for uh, for skilled labor and engineering uh, services. Uh, now, now this this is this is a very challenging combination. I, I have to say that Western Canada has the same, precisely the same combination of remote locations, very tight environmental regulations, uh, so tight labor market, uh, so, and so on. Uh, the, US, the U.S. Gulf Coast is in a much more advantageous position. Uh, it, has been a, uh, it has been an oil and gas region for 100 years, so there's a much, much broader labor pool uh, in terms of engineering workers, suppliers, and so on. A lot of the infrastructure is already in place, both in the case of Australia and also in the case of in, in the future for the future Canadian projects, linking the upstream with the site of the terminal by pipeline uh, is a major part of the challenge. That's already done for our, for our brownfield project where the pipeline. Uh, so so I, think the, I think when we observe that so far the US experience, fingers crossed, is more favorable, I think that, 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 that is a fundamental reason for that. Uh, having said that, uh, um, I'm, I'm also watching very intensely some of the technological developments. One is the, the, the smaller scale modular uh, LNG facilities. Theoretically, large facilities would have a, a economies of scale advantage, but if you can have uh, factory manufactured modular facilities with a very low project management risk, uh, whereas with a mega project, chances are that you have some project management issue, that, that, can, that can be a very interesting alternative. Uh, and some, in some regions we see the emergence of that. And also uh, the, uh, the, the first couple of floating projects uh, are now hitting uh, production. And Samsung is apparently doing a very good job constructing the prelude uh, floating LNG for, uh, for Shell. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, there seem to be no serious project management issue on the Korean side. Uh, but again, whether, uh, whether this is, will be something which is, a, which is an engineering miracle and a nice shell project, or whether this is something where, where there will be several more projects. Because Samsung did a very good job building Prelude, but I mean, how many engineering companies are out there which have the same capability uh, as, uh, as Samsung? Uh, probably not very many. Uh, so floating LNG could emerge uh, as a very interesting technology, but it's, it's, it's too early to declare success. Sort of a follow-up, quick follow-up question. The, uh, you mentioned uh, sort of a, a shipping, uh, sh sort of shipyard and technology um, side uh, potential constraint on uh, floating LNG, LNG. But in general, for the LNG industry, you know, could the shipping side be uh, one of the constraints? You know, if we do have 
all these uh, uh, volumes you know, materialize in the next uh, No, that, that, does not, that does not seem to be a, a big concern because right now, the, basically, pretty much all the Japanese and Korean shipyards are, are running flat out uh, uh, constructing uh, LNG ships. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some 80 large con tankers under construction. And uh, more than one third of the, the tankers under construction are owned by financial investors uh, who build a tanker uh, and their business model is that they will lease out the tanker and make it available for, for spot traders. Uh, so, uh, so I think we will see, uh, so we, we will see a, 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 a quite favorable uh, market situation for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, quickly, yes. Yeah. Doug Hengel, German Marshall Fund. Laszlo, um, how much uh, U.S. LNG do you see going to Europe vis-a-vis -vis Asia, and is that based on contracts already signed or price assumptions? Uh, it's around half-half, uh, and it is, uh, it is uh, based on the, the modeling of the, uh, of the LNG market because uh, uh, the U.S. contracts uh, are signed without destination restriction. Now, some of the buyers are European buyers, but even those European buyers will ship it to Asia without hesitation if the market is more uh, attractive in Asia. Uh, but uh, two things uh, will drive uh, significant quantities of U.S. LNG into Europe. One, that there's this massive flood of LNG coming from Australia to Asia. Uh, so that... Uh, we, even before U.S. LNG coming uh, to Europe, we, 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 we already observe a change in the trading strategy of Qatar. So Qatar is already increasing uh, its uh, sales in Europe uh, because they see the incoming Australian wave uh, and they don't want a price war with the Australians uh, in Japan. Uh, so, uh, and the second thing is that the, the Pacific is a pretty big ocean. Uh, so the shipping costs are significantly uh, higher from the U.S. Gulf Coast uh, to East Asia uh, than to Europe, and even the Panama Canal extension will not help much uh, in this respect. So, so you would need a you would need a sizable price differential uh, between Europe and Asia uh, to, dry, to, uh, to to eliminate the shipping cost advantage. Michel. Hi, Michelle Melton with the CSIS Energy Program. Laszlo, thank you. This was, as always, fascinating and entertaining. Um, we really enjoy your presentations here, so thanks for coming. Um, I was hoping you could expand a little bit on uh, gas competition with wind, solar, IT, and I would add um, demand response and demand side resources, like what we're seeing in the U.S. right now. Um, you were speaking mostly about um, solar and wind taking away uh, market share from gas in markets where, uh, in, in gas importing markets, I was wondering if you could talk about whether, I know this is obviously the medium term gas market report, but whether your models go out and show any um, uh, eating into competition in gas exporting markets like the US. Um, what, what are the cost assumptions that are necessary? What are your cost assumptions for, for uh, price declines among gas, uh, excuse me, wind and solar? Um, just if you could speak a little bit about uh, the next, you know, beyond the medium term, maybe the next 10 years uh, sure. in that respect. I Thanks. I mean, wind, I mean, wind and solar are currently the most rapidly growing electricity generation sources, and the, the technology is, is improving very nicely. Uh, in, in Europe, wind and solar investment currently is around $100 million a day. Uh, and that, but that has proven to be quite robust, even to the Eurozone crisis. Uh, and the, so so that, that, that is not going to uh, go away. Uh, uh, the, uh, so... One question is whether gas is cost competitive on a per kilowatt hour basis with wind and solar. Uh, and that is, inc that is increasingly a challenge. Uh, not, I mean, renewables are not, you, you cannot make an, an across the board statement that renewables are now competitive everywhere. That is not true. What you need is a combination of good resources and good policies that attract investment. Okay, that's, uh, if you have that combination, that you can, you have a good regulatory policy which can channel low cost of, low cost of capital financing into a place which is 
where the natural resources for wind and solar uh, are good, then, then you made it. Uh, and the examples that I showed you, like, the, like the, the South African solar or the Brazilian wind, are these good examples. There are, of course, many bad examples. Uh, so so you, can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can have a reviewable policy going bad in multiple ways. Uh, the, uh, but in terms of volumes, the, we, don't matter, we do project gas-fired power, uh, gas power generation increasing globally. There's, there's no doubt about it. Around half of the growth of gas is generated by the growth of gas-fired power generation. But renewables are emerging as a serious competitor, and renewables are eating into the pie uh, quite significantly. Now, of course, you, the, you have the problem of the integration of wind and solar to the power system, which can, this is a technological problem which can be solved, but the, system, the, but the system transformation that you need is not trivial. So you need better interconduction capacity on the electricity transmission side, and I would say that both Europe and the United States and Japan systematically underinvest in the electricity transmission networks, so there's nowhere near on track uh, for, for that. Then you don't simply need the better physical infrastructure, you also need to transform how this infrastructure is managed. Now in that case, there, are, there, are, there is no perfect model uh, in this respect, because for example, the Europeans are doing a better job in improving renewable forecasting, and they are doing a better job uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, continuous intraday price signals, but the Americans are doing a better job in introducing locational signals uh, into the electricity system. So I would say that for, for me, the ideal, uh, the ideal uh, system would be a combination of the good examples uh, from, from Europe and the United States, but that faces a very significant institutional barrier, again, in many, many uh, power systems. Electric battery technology is improving, but under realistic technological assumptions, it's not going to solve the problem alone. Uh, so the bottom line is that you will continue to need the good old-fashioned flexible power generation in the power system. Uh, in fact, let's say if, I, if you take the, our 450 ppm uh, scenario, which is an all-hands-to-the-deck effort to tackle climate change, uh, in that, the gas-fired power generation, which is in the European system, is almost the same as in the base case, uh, the, and around 80 gigawatts more than the current one. Now, this is a very good news for G and Siemens, the companies who are in the business of selling those gas turbines. Okay, this is not necessarily a good news for Gazprom and Chateau, the companies who are in the business of selling the gas, because when you operate a gas turbine only when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining, then your utilization collapses to roughly 1,000 hours a year. Uh, so, so you don't consume a lot of gas, but you consume that gas in a very volatile and very unpredictable fashion. Essentially, your operational volatility will be the mirror image of the volatility of wind and solar. So, so, so the actual volumes are not very high. And our 450 ppm scenario, global gas consumption is increasing, even in the 450 ppm case, but the rate of increase is only 0.7% compared to the two that we currently project. So an awful lot of gas stays on the ground. Uh, and you need, a, you need a very different gas infrastructure. You need, a, you, need, you need pipeline systems and you need gas storage facilities which are optimized for this new role of gas. And this, this has not happened yet. Okay, so even if you take the United States last, uh, uh, last winter during the polar vortex, uh, US electricity consumption jumped uh, by 5% compared to the seasonally normal level. Uh, during the polar vortex, of course, there was not much sunshine. It was very windy, so wind was doing well, but 4% out of the five came from coal. Yeah, so the, uh, so the, the a low carbon system will have to have flexibility from new sources. And that, uh, that is still a challenge in, in, in practically every country. Thanks for the patience. It's all right, thanks. Dave Nagel, formerly VP. I have a question about methane emissions. It's been a subject that's been debated, analyzed here at CSIS, uh, and a pretty active conversation in the U.S. Are similar conversations occurring elsewhere that have come onto your radar screen elsewhere across the globe? A and if so, how do you see that impacting utilization of gas? 
Uh, very, very good question. I, I think the, the United States probably has the strongest uh, conversation in this respect. I mean, in Europe, you know, in Europe, the conclusion is very simple. Gas is a fossil fuel. Fossil fuels are evil. Gas is evil. Uh, with methane emissions, it's one more reason to regard it evil. Uh, the, uh, so the, in Asia, uh, in Asia, this does feed into uh, the, uh, the conversation because uh, uh, if, you have a, if you have a bad gas upstream project, then the carbon intensity of an LNG-fired, gas-fired power plant in Asia could conceivably be worse than for a good ultra-supercritical coal-fired power plant. Uh, and that, that, is, that, is emer that is emerging in the discussion in Asia, uh, that, the, that uh, uh, you know, how much methane leakage you can have uh, before you would kill uh, the advantages of, let's say, a US LNG project uh, in, uh, in Japan compared to a cutting edge uh, ultra supercritical coal plant. And the, and the answer to that is that, the, is that uh, the, uh, if you have a, a professionally well managed upstream project applying the proper green well completion techniques. Uh, and the pipeline systems are operated. I mean, I, I come, I'm coming from the, from, an, from the oil and gas industry, and I have a, I have a hardline view uh, on this question. I think this, is, I think this is essentially a managerial problem. I think the, I think the, the oil and gas, gas industry has all the technological and engineering capabilities to keep metal leakage uh, at a very, very low level, which would safeguard all the environmental advantages of gas. The, the question is whether there is a proper management attention uh, to the issue. In some companies, the answer is yes. Uh, in other companies, it's unfortunately no. Uh, so the, our, our impression is that, in, that the metal leakage is, there's a long tail of badly operating projects and they have a disproportionate share uh, of the metal leakage. Uh, so I think the, the, the challenge is to, to, I would say, to bring up the management performance to us go to a consistently uh, high level, both for upstream and also for pipeline uh, operations. So natural gas may be the, the evil in Europe, but it seems to be sort of both the lesser evil, uh, specifically in this uh, shipping um, industry, or I'm not, uh, as a, you know, bunker fuel. And I actually, I've been wanting to ask you, and this, this you know, your question gave me a perfect, perfect segue. You did mention that, uh, you know, the, the regulations, uh, one of the drivers, if you could just elaborate on, you know, certainly, you know, Europe, European, uh, the, uh, you know, regulations have been widely reported, but, you know, is Europe basically leading uh, the trend and are people following? I mean, what, what are some of the, the trends uh, in that? On, on, on shipping, Europe does play an important role because first in the Baltic Sea and then in the Mediterranean and the North Sea as well, uh, sulfur dioxide regulations were introduced into ships uh, uh, as, as well. And that, uh, that uh, triggered an, uh, an, an increasing interest in, you know, it, it started with easy small-scale projects like ferries in Norwegian fjords, uh, or, or that then it also came to inland shipping in the rain uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to find uh, uh, accurate data, uh, as, uh, the, the data on it, but, but there's certainly, it's certainly going on. I think where, where Europe is missing an opportunity is the, uh, is the, the, uh, the road transportation sector, uh, where, I mean, the city of Paris, for example, I mean, France has a low carbon nuclear dominated electricity system, uh, and the city of Paris actually has an, an awful particle emission problem, uh, all coming from diesel engines. Uh, so the, uh, so there is more to environmental pollution than coal-fired power plants. Uh, so, and there, uh, natural gas vehicles could play a much bigger role than that, what they do today. Any other questions? Sure, Linda. Uh, Linda Doman, Energy Information Administration. I'd be interested in hearing how your views on Mexico have changed on supply and demand since the uh, legislative changes uh, between last year's outlook and this year's outlook, plus the prices. Yes. Uh, now, we, 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 are, we are very excited uh, about the, the policy reforms in Mexico. Uh, and they, I mean, it's, it, they are really doing a very, very good job, and they are overturning decades-long uh, long traditions. Uh, I think what is, a, what is going to be a challenge uh, for, for Mexico uh, is... The, 
uh, that very soon we will have an endless flood of dirt cheap American gas in Mexico. Now, this is actually a benefit for the, for the Mexican industry in general, because you know, Mexico is a, is a country on a medium scale, medium level development. They, they are in a stage of development where their growth should be driven by uh, manufacturing outsourcing from the United States. They actually have industrial electricity prices which, is, which are twice as high uh, as the US uh, uh, electricity prices. So this, this flood of very cheap uh, American gas which enables Mexico to significantly cost, cut the cost of power generation. Uh, this is a very good thing for the Mexican economy in general. Specifically for the gas sector, that means that any new Mexican shale gas project will have to have the same cost efficiency as the ones in Eagle Ford from day one, because they co will compete with the same gas price. And even though you know, the shale resources of northern Mexico are quite attractive, but still, uh, you know, Achieving the same cost efficiency as Eagle Ford from day one, I mean, that's a very tough bar. And in almost everywhere else in the world, like for example, Argentina, uh, is, uh, where the, I have to say that the legal and investment environment in Argentina is much, much worse than in Mexico. But the initial development in Vaca Muerta competes with imported LNG. So they have a, they have a shield. They can, have, they can spend a couple of years figuring out how to do it. Uh, Mexico does not have this grace period. So we actually project uh, a stagnating gas production in Mexico uh, and a very big flood of U.S. exports to Mexico. Um, I guess the EIA has also uh, mentioned uh, in the, uh, the AEO, right, that there will be a uh, greater volume of uh, U.S. gas going, but uh, certainly uh, primarily via pipelines. I mean, for, for now, yeah, that's the, yes, yes. yeah, sounds good. Um, ooh, so it's already time, it, unless anyone, sure, one last question. Uh, my name is Ilona Doja, I'm uh, with the Atlantic Council. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is how you uh, exactly manage to, uh, or imagine uh, the U.S. energy to reach the central eastern uh, European region, like is a uh, pipeline integration and uh, building interconnect uh, interconnectors is, is already enough uh, to connect uh, the CE region to the Western European uh, LNG facilities, or or um, uh, will the EU be able to finance uh, projects like the Kirk Island LNG terminal together? Uh, because I believe like Croatia would not be. Uh, able to do that alone and uh, Lithuania is also like criticized for its LNG terminal because it's not uh, entirely uh, economy vi uh, economically viable. Uh, so like a regional cooperation is definitely needed uh, in this field. Um, and my second question is, um, uh, in my understanding you spoke about US LNG reaching Europe uh, solely on an economic basis. And I, um, I just wonder how politics can be connected to this. Uh, the uh, U.S. seems to be reluctant to have an energy chapter in TTIP uh, negotiations, uh, while it could be a useful uh, security for, uh, or in the European point of view. Um, so do you see any risk on that, or, or this gas will reach uh, Europe in, a, in an economic uh, basis as well, and there is just no need about like, connecting politics to this? Thanks. Yeah, I'll start with the, with the second question. Uh, basically, our... our, our uh, our analysis uh, is based on the, on the observation that, uh, uh, I mean, the U.S. has a quite complicated licensing regime for LNG facilities, but in, in every single case, when, the final, when a final decision was made on an export project, the final decision was positive. Uh, so there is, there's, not a single, there's not a single case when the U.S. government would have prohibited uh, an, LNG, uh, an LNG export project. Uh, it's an interesting discussion of why the process is so long and why, whether it could be shortened and, and so on. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, the, the baseline assumption is that the US LNG export projects will be based on project economics uh, and contracts. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and, and the base assumption is that any, any US LNG project which has private investors who are prepared to make the investment uh, will eventually get the approval from the U.S. government. 
so we don't, we, don't assume, uh, we don't assume the US government putting legal and political restrictions on exports. The export level, uh, in our view, will be determined by, uh, by project economics. Uh, the, uh, and if you work from this assumption, then incorporating it into the free, the, I, incorporating it into the, the transatlantic uh, free trade agreement would not really change the outlook. Uh, the, uh, for, your, for your first question, um, Lithuania and Poland already has LNG terminals uh, which are underutilized with plenty of excess capacity so that uh, the, the, the spot LNG cargoes can go directly there. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the, there is a large excess capacity of LNG terminals uh, in northwestern Europe, uh, the uh, Zeebrugge, Rotterdam, uh, the terminals uh, in the southern United Kingdom, plus Dunkirk uh, in France is coming online this year. Uh, this, uh, uh, this region ha has the pipeline infrastructure to what will actually happen that this region will buy less Norwegian gas, more Norwegian gas will go to Germany, less Russian gas will go to Germany, uh, so the pipeline flows will readjust. From Germany onwards back to Central Eastern Europe, uh, the transgas system in the Czech Republic is, is already fully reverse flow capable, and as of today, it is already running in a reserve, res, a reserve flow mode. So the Czech system is already delivering gas from the west to the east, uh, and the Slovak system is, already, is also uh, reverse flow capable. There are still issues in the, in the German-Polish border, and also Italy has significant uh, underutilized LNG capacity, but the Italy-Austria pipeline interconnector is also not fully reverse flow capable. In both cases, in the German, Polish, and the, and the Austria-Italy uh, uh, border, the reverse flow capability is around, around, only around 20% of, uh, of the capacity on the other direction. And also, in, uh, uh, also all around Central Eastern Europe, there are major issues uh, in about the transparency of capacity allocation. So the general principle on, in European law that every, every interconnector has to be reverse flow capable and capacity allocation has to be done in a market-based and transparent fashion. And who would disagree to that? But when you take a look at the actual situation in the ground, there are many governments in Central Eastern Europe who have a very creative interpretation of what, what, what a transparent market-based allocation is. So that's, that, that uh, touches back on, on, on your question, is that uh, uh, in Europe, the issue is not simply building new pipelines. The issue is a much stronger enforcement of the already existing uh, energy and competition uh, legislation. I also had uh, personal involvement in my previous job in the Crick uh, LNG terminal. I came to the conclusion that a fusion reactor is a more realistic short-term solution uh, than that. Uh, that, uh, I mean, that can change. Uh, if, if you have significant quantities of cheap US LNG being available, changing the attitude of the key stakeholders, it might even happen. Uh, but but that, that project had a long and sad history. Well, thank you so much, Laz. I mean, both the presentation and Q&A uh, session were just superb. Uh, I'm always happy to have Laszlo back, and I hope you all keep coming back. Um, please join me in thanking Laszlo.